Hello everyone, this is Matthews. I'm a philosophy PhD student from Brazil. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to study Nietzsche's core concept of perspectivism. And we are going to look at this incredible idea, fascinating theme, which is an object of study from my PhD thesis, from two of Nietzsche's books, The Will to Power and On the Genealogy of Morals, and with the help of this paper by Stephen D. Hales, a professor at Bloomsburg University. The paper is called Nietzsche's Epistemic Perspectivism. Uh, Dr. Hales has also written a book on the subject with uh, Rex Welshen, and he's an authority in the contemporary debate, so I will put the link to, the, to his book and to the article in the description. This article is part of a book on perspectivism, which is actually organized by the philosopher of science, Michela Massimi, a very influential figure also with very interesting ideas on perspectivism in science, which is different from Nietzsche's perspectivism, and I'm going to do a, a whole other, other video about that, but let's get into it now. So, first we are going to look at this most famous passage on perspectivism, which is included uh, on the will to power. I have here the Kaufman classic translation. So it's number 481, belief in the ego, the subject. Nietzsche writes, against positivism, which halts at phenomena. There are only facts, I would say. No, facts is precisely what there is not. Only interpretations. We cannot establish any fact in itself. Perhaps it is folly to want to do such a thing. Everything is sub subjective, you say. But even this is an interpretation. The subject is not something given. It is something added and invented and projected behind what there is. Finally, it is necessary to posit an interpreter behind the, inter the interpretation. Even this is an invention, hypothesis. Insofar as the word knowledge has any meaning, the word is knowable, but it is interpretable otherwise. It has no meaning behind it, but countless meanings. Perspectivism. So here he, he goes on to write the, the, the term perspectivism. It is our needs that interpret the world our drives and their for and against. Every drive is a kind of lust to rule. Each one has its perspective that it would like to compel, that it would like to compel all the other drives to accept as a norm. So what are the key takeaways from this? When Nietzsche says there are no facts, only interpretations, he's not saying that this is a fact, right? This that he's saying is a fact. No. Later on, in another work, um, Beyond Good and Evil, he goes on to address that possible critique, saying that when he talks about the prejudices of the physicist, he talks that, he says that, well, if this is an interpretation, so, so much the better, right? Because, uh, of course, he's not uh, trying to propose a self-defeating affirmation. Nor is he denying, as Dr. Hales clarifies, the existence of truth, but rather the existence of eternal and absolute truths. We're going to talk about that. And secondly, you have to think that uh, the aphorism starts with um, mention to mention of positivism, which was a, a huge doctrine that uh, s uh, made people and scientists and academics look at the, the scientific methods and practices as 
almost a religious uh, activity, right? Uh, and science became a sort of religion there at the 19th century context that Nietzsche was writing, very influenced by positivism and Augusta Comte's doctrine. So he is trying to criticize that in the first place, right? The, the phrase, the, the, the aphorism starts with this, against positivism, which holds that phenomena, there are only facts, I would say no. Facts is precisely what there is not, only interpretations. So even the subject, which is the title, the belief in the subject, is an interpretation. This I call Matthews. That you call Dr. Stephen Hales. That's another interpretation. It's not something given by the universe, right? Uh, and also, when Nietzsche says this, he's not trying to uh, support a relativistic nihilism. On the contrary, you could, you could include the following statement. Now, give your interpretation, right? Let's think about the, the interpretations that we want. And Nietzsche would point to life as a sort of criteria for electing values, life-affirming values are more important to him than uh, life-denying uh, value, values, like Christian values, nihilistic, pessimistic, idealistic values, uh, according to him. I would recommend the book by John Richardson, Nietzsche's Values, which is very important on that. All right, now we are going to look at On the Genealogy of Morals, section 3, 12. And I'm not going to read uh, the whole uh, passage because it's very long. And the key point is that he's criticizing idealist philosophers, especially Kant, uh, for his belief that there could be disinterested judgments or claims or uh, knowledge for him, for Nietzsche. Uh, a claim is always going to be interested, even when it comes to beauty, for example. In the, in the third critique, Kant says that beauty is disinterested. And Nietzsche, in this very work, criticized this idea, because nothing can be disinterested. Uh, there is no subject for Nietzsche. There is only activity, right? The will to power as a, an ontological principle, non-metaphysical, non transcendent in this sense. There's no essence, right? So it's all activity. So when you look at something and you think it's beautiful, that's uh, an affect, that's interest, that's not disinterested. So anyway, so let's read a little bit and then we're going to comment on that. But precisely because we seek knowledge, let us not be ungrateful to such resolute reversals of accustomed perspectives and valuations with which the spirit has, with apparent mischievousness and futility, raged against itself for so long. To see differently in this way for once, to want to see differently, is no small discipline and preparation of the intellect for its future objectivity. The latter understood not as contemplation without interest, which is a nonsensical absurdity, but as the ability to control one's pro and con and to dispose of them, so that one knows how to employ a variety of perspectives and affective interpretations in the service of knowledge. So this reveals a lot already. Henceforth, my dear philosophers, let us be on guard against the dangerous old conceptual fiction deposited a pure, willless, painless, timeless, knowing subject. Let us guard against the snares of such contradictory concepts as pure reason. So uh, for Nietzsche, uh, the idea of pure reason, pure reason is, a, is a contradictory idea. <laughs> Uh, like the, the critique of pure reason that's absurd for Nietzsche. So, uh, absolute spirituality, knowledge in itself, this always demands that we should think of an eye that is 
completely unthinkable, and I turned it into no particular direction, in which the active and interpreting forces through which alone seeing becomes seeing something are supposed to be lacking. This always demands of the eye an absurdity and a nonsense. There is only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing. And the more effects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing, our objective, our objectivity be. But to eliminate the will altogether, to suspend each and every effect, supposing we were capable of this, what would that mean but to castrate the intellect? So in German, he says, uh, Es gibt nur ein perspektivisches Sehen, nur ein perspektivisches Erkennen. Erkennen would be something like knowing, uh, uh, like uh, comprehending maybe. Uh, it, so what he's saying that all knowledge is perspectival and if we use different perspectives uh, to compose our knowledge, our understanding, which is uh, a little different from knowledge uh, according to Hales, the more complete it's going to be. So this is a very, very key idea and a very profound one, one that is very rich for us at this moment when perspectivism is gaining a lot of attention in various areas. So let's see what Dr. Hayes has to say. He, I'm going to read some quotations from the article. So first he writes that Nietzsche for a long time was fought off by, by people like Arthur Danto and other scholars as someone uh, skeptic, right? But to reduce Nietzsche to skepticism is, uh, uh, is very mistaken, uh, if you take a more careful reading. Even reducing Nietzsche to relativism is a, a, a grave mistake, because uh, as Dr. Hayes states, Nietzsche uh, demonstrates a great respect for knowledge and for truth along his work, uh, you can look at the, the works like uh, Human, All to Human, there he shows a lot of respect for truth. Uh, uh, Sunrise, uh, I think it's Dawn, right? The, the, <laughs> the right uh, title in English. So it is puzzling that those who regard Nietzsche as a skeptic not only skip over his criticism of skepticism, but somehow miss the occasions when he walks his more extreme claims about knowledge back. In BGE 208, Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche remarks that when a philosopher suggests these days that he is not a skeptic, everybody is annoyed. Skepticism, Nietzsche claims, is a fashionable decadence, a soporific sedative, Entertaining no hypothesis at all might well be part of a good taste. Skepticism and absolutism are opposite sides of the same devalued coin. Take, this, take a look at this passage from Human All to Human, where Nietzsche writes, No honey is sweeter than that of knowledge. There you go, the respect for knowledge. So Dr. Hales writes, Perspectivism in contemporary philosophy of science has to do with human limitations and focused interests. For example, we see colors only along a very narrow band of electromagnetic radiation, which restricts our connection to the external world. In addition, our scientific theories often aim to model the world only at some interest relative scale, as we see moving from atomic physics to chemistry to biology. Scientific perspectivism of this sort is arguably a realist theory. Now this is very interesting. Dr. Hayes assumes a stance where he claims that Nietzsche's perspectivism would not uh, fit quite well uh, under uh, this more narrow contemporary perspectivism in the field of the philosophy of science 
which is exactly what I'm aiming to do with my thesis, to connect the two uh, to the extent that they can be, of course, connected. Nietzsche's perspectivism and philosophy of science realism perspectivism. So this is a, a very important part for, for my studies. So he says, Nietzsche's perspe perspectivism is broader and less focused. For him, perspectivism is not one precisely defined doctrine, but a cluster of related ideas about the subjectivity of truth, anti-realist metaphysics, a bundle theory of objects, the revaluation of values, and the creation of one's own virtues, and the role of varying interpretations in knowledge. Nietzsche did not have a, a time to refine this idea. We don't have a, a, a complete doctrine of perspectivism in his work, even because he was not a systematic thinker. So maybe uh, given the opportunity to refine the perspectivism he's talking about, it could match claims of the philosophy of science perspectivism. So especially when you look at on the genealogy of morals, the section that I read, it, it is very fitting uh, in my interpretation. Nietzsche is plainly not denying the existence of truth, but existence of absolute truths or eternal facts. He writes, uh, referring to the passage from Human All to Human 2, stating that there are no eternal facts, nor are there any absolute truths. He writes, Nietzsche is not precise about exactly what he considers to be a perspective, but they are best characterized as ways of knowing or doxastic practices. The, the idea of doxa is very commonly associated with opinion. I think it's fair to say it's a little more than that, even in Nietzsche's perspectivism. Uh, he writes that Bernard Heginster, a famous Nietzsche scholar, describes this paradox of perspectivism as dominating the previous 20 years of English-speaking Nietzsche scholarship. So, this is one of the, the most interesting parts as well. Uh, Dr. Hales writes, One way to salvage Nietzsche's perspectivism is the following. Instead of insisting that everything is perspectival, one could uh, avert that everything true is per perspectively true. The vital difference being the two formulations can be brought out with an analogy. Compare everything is possible to everything true is possible, possibly true. No one except the pathologically optimistic would defend the idea that everything is possible, but everything true is possibly true is so obvious as to hardly rate a comment. Nietzsche is then free to argue that there are perspectives, that truth is indexed to perspectives, that there is no such thing as truth outside of or independent from perspectives, and so on. Those structural claims are true in all perspectives without risk of self-refutation. Everything true is perspectively true is compatible with there being absolute truths that are true in all perspectives while also permitting that there are merely perspectival truths that are true in some perspectives and false in others. And then he writes that Nietzsche also offers the second order perspectivism, which is a methodological perspectivism, much similar to Descartes' use of methodological skepticism, right? The, the Cartesian doubt that allowed him to establish his first truth, his, his first truth uh, from which he intended to build the possible knowledge. So it's very interesting, the comparison. With first-order perspectivism, Nietzsche is partly offering a theory of knowledge in which diverse perspectives generate distinct kinds of knowledge. Second-order perspectivism is a way of taking a stance on those first-order points of view and utilizing them to produce understanding. So, when he talks about 
producing understanding. I think he, he formulates it very well uh, because it's not that dichotomical relationship between the subjects and the uh, the objects that he is going to uh, encapsulate with his with truth, right? He's going rather to enhance the understanding of reality with uh, different perspectives, including his own. And he also says that falsehood, falsehood is, a comp uh, is, an, is an important component for understanding the world. And Nietzsche talks about the, a lot about illusion, art, and the values in that. Uh, the condition, the non-truth creates conditions for truth. So he addresses uh, the, the other passage from Beyond Good and Evil, where he talks about the interpretation of even physics, and not physics being uh, a inter another interpretation, and not a world explanation. Well, how can physics, our most fundamental and successful science, just be an interpretation? But if instead this passage is really a statement of methodological perspectivism, then it sounds downright reasonable. Physics is one tool to understand the world, one perspective of great reach and fecundity. At the same time, it would be foolish to expect physics to help us understand the aesthetic dimension of starry night or mass in D minor. This is great, great passage. So, it even points to me uh, uh, to this possible agreement between Nietzsche's perspectivism and realism perspectivism. What do you think? What is your opinion? Thank you very much for watching. I hope this lecture was good for you. Write uh, any questions you have in the comment sections. I'll be glad to answer them. And well, Dr. Stephen Hales, thank you very much for your work. If, you, if this video has reached you, please contact me by sending an email to the email address you're seeing on the screen. It would be a great pleasure and an honor to interview you, sir, here on my channel. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll see you in the next lecture.